Uh, you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Great. Uh, so I'm not going to be looking at the camera. It's uh, pointed. In, it's on a different monitor, but uh, I'm there with you. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the library that I wrote um, earlier this year. Um, the reason why I did it uh, uh, because I have this image processing library that I wrote a while back, and uh, I had no understanding of color whatsoever. So I did a, uh, quite a bit of research, uh, but by no means I'm an expert in the field. It's just my hobby, and um, but I did learn quite a bit of stuff that I did want to share with you guys. So this is the library. It's called Color, American Spelling with a capital C. Uh, it's not this uh, color library that with the British spelling that's been around for, for ages, uh, since uh, uh, 2008. Um, it does co cover some of the concept, but it's a lot less. Um, um, it has a lot less in implemented, and uh, it's definitely less performant. So I'm not going to be talking about that. Um, uh, this is the GitHub repository. Uh, if you want to poke around, submit pull requests, feel free. I'll be happy to do to talk to you about that. I'm going to be. Uh, doing the presentation in uh, iHaskell just because it gives us ability to, uh, you know, to view actual colors. It's not that easy to do it in GHCI. Uh, normally, I would post a place where you can poke around, but setting up iHaskell is uh, not that uh, straightforward and takes quite a bit of time. Therefore, if you already have a set set up, this is where you can find those uh, 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 Jupyter Playbook well, notebooks um, uh, but we'll all just follow the, the demo and I think it, it, will, it will be sufficient. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we need to bring some imports uh, into scope. Uh, this is um, a module that uh, con contains all the helpers. Uh, and this is the module from the library that I'm going to be talking about, which is a uh, graphics color model right here. Um, and a few other helpers uh, that you don't need to worry about. Um, the most common thing every developer has to deal with is, uh, well, RGB, right? Uh, we all had to deal at some point one in our life with the CSS horrors and uh, anything that you want to present to the user, you got to deal with RGB. Uh, how do we construct RGB? Uh, we take three values whatever precision you want, and we get back a color, which is uh, RGB and with that precision. So for example, let's go ahead and construct RGB with the word eight precision uh, with zero, 125, and 255 per channel. So red, green, and blue. And we'll go ahead and show the color, see what, what the color is, okay? This prints it nicely. Uh, let's go ahead and see how it actually looks. Um, well, as you expect, it's sort of bluish color that, uh, because we had 255 here, um, it sort of matches this. It, it wasn't it was not on purpose. Um, okay, well, what if we want to have this color not in word eight precision, but word sixteen? If we want to do some some math on it and don't lose uh, precision. Uh, normally, in Haskell, what do we do? We do from integral from integral, and we can map over over a color. And uh, we get 0, 125 to 55, but now it's worth 16 precision. Great. What happens when we try to show this color? Wait, wait a second. It's black. That's not what you want. Of course, because we need to scale the values, and I'm pretty sure you sort of expect that. Uh, normally, people try to go ahead and re-implement that stuff where there is no need. Color library provides this uh, scaling and actually heavily uses, uh, uses this for conversion between colors. Um, there are functions like two word 16, which uh, uh, will take any uh, anything that implements elevator. It's a class that allows you to elevate between precisions. Uh, I don't know, if it's just the best name that came to my mind years ago. And uh, um, and this uh, does the right thing what we expected when we call uh, when we map this function over each channel it does scale it as we would expect zero 
and um, to the max bound. And of course, when we display this color, it shows us the same color. That's good. By the way, this disp display color is not a function that is in the color library. This is a helper that allows us to, to show this color inside of the iHaskell uh, playbooks. And what it does uh, behind the scene, it uh, converts it to an image and shows an image. Um, there are more functions like that. They convert it to other different precisions, 32, 64 bits. And of course, if we go there and back, we would expect to get the same value. Great. And same thing for the floating point. Uh, there are 32 bit floats and, or double precision floating points get exactly what we expect because we don't have a maximum or minimum value of floating points really so we have a, a range from zero to one if we do the scaling in fact it's uh, it's not very straightforward when people think about it uh it might sound straightforward but it's not i even found a bug in ghc when uh, doing this sort of conversions um uh the Regular types that you'd use with uh, with colors, uh, they all have these elevator in instances and uh, two uh, um, functions that are presented in the, in the elevator, um, mean value and max value. For these types, it's mean bound and max bound, and for floating point, as I said, it's zero and one. And you can go ahead and see this. And of course, uh, complex and a bit types are, uh, not really used in the color library, but they're very useful in image processing. Uh, so that's why they're also present here. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, oh, of course, if we provide the values that are outside the range, the library will go ahead and uh, clamp the values appropriately. So if we go a little bit over the one, it's not gonna wrap around, uh, or if you totally wrong value, it's also not gonna wrap around. Uh, it also has the functionality for going into arbitrary floating points. So if you write in a function that needs to deal with floating point uh, numbers, but you don't wanna restrict it to the 32 or 64 bit ahead of time, you can use this to real float and from real float functions, and uh, they will uh, allow you to specify later on uh, which floating point value you wanna deal with. And uh, uh, if you wanna go back, it's the same thing. So CF is a, uh, our RGB uh, uh, color in floating point. And here we, we just go back. And it's pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, if you think about it, it's uh, RGB, all it is, it's RGB color model, it, all it is, it's a, a vector of, with uh, three values, right? It's a 3D vector. Um, okay, um, so what, what is actually a color model, right? You know, we've talked about individual channels, but what does it make, what does it mean to be a color model in, in, in color library? Um, all it is, it's anything that implements this, uh, this class color model. And uh, it allows us to, uh, it's mostly used internally, but it, uh, it, it is visible as a restriction on many, uh, many functions. It allows us to show uh, a little bit of trickery to allow us to unbox any color. So it, it can be used with uh, unbox vectors. Uh, same with storable, so you can send them over to SeaWorld if you want. And of course, uh, very, very extremely convenient classes such as functor, applicative, foldable, traversable, and uh, queue and show, of course. And uh, functor and applicative allow us to also implement num and fractional and floating uh, and bounded and and have data for all colors. So, and of course, that box, as I said. So we can actually treat any color as if it was a number. Well, let's go ahead and look at those instances, uh, how they work. Oh, and of course, this is the, uh, the actual documentation with uh, all the possible color models uh, that are available in the library. And we'll talk more about, uh, about some of them. Uh, so foldable, of course, it's very straightforward. We can sum all of the channels. If we sum this, we get 1.5. Uh, we can use the applicative 
So we can go ahead and apply a different function to the individual channel, and we can uh, um, use it as a traversable. So uh, guard, for example, for a positive value or uh, greater than uh, zero value, and we will get enough. Uh, this is just so you, for your information, if you ever deal with it, you you have all this available to you. And as I said, this is level, the most useful one is uh, the actual num fraction and floating because well, colors are really numbers, and we are able to, uh, for example, divide, uh, add individual channels, and construct a color just from a uh, uh, original or in integral uh, literals. And uh, as I said, there is also unbox and storable. This is just an example of how to construct an array that is a, a storable, uh, that is three by four array of RGB pixels or RGB colors, I should say. Um, this is purely demonstrational and uh, doesn't serve any particular interest to us. So let's go ahead and talk about what color models are available. That's more of what we expect from this talk. Uh, we've talked about red, green, blue. Uh, some things that uh, um, come up very often is uh, a hue family um, color models, hue saturation intensity, hue saturation value, and hue saturation lightness or brightness. Uh, there is also a YCVCR. Um, and I'll talk more about where they used and what, what was their purpose, but I just want to have a little introduction first. Uh, CMYK used mostly for printing and has four channels, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And, um, and an alpha channel uh, that can be added to any of the color models. For each of those uh, color models, we have a helper function that can go, that can take us from our GB color model to, uh, to the corresponding color model and back. And if we call RGB to HSV on our uh, color that we created before, um, then uh, we get this this value in a in hue saturation value, and we can go ahead and explain it and get back the same the same color. Um, oh, color is yes, yes, <laughs> color models, um, and we can construct a color CMYK in the same fashion. Uh, we would expect uh, some of those, uh, most of those conversion functions to uh, uh, round trip, and uh, most of them do, but not all of them. Um, for example, uh, he, when they round trip, they round trip with a little bit of an error. For example, uh, here's a little bit of a discrepancy. And uh, uh, also, CMYK has four channels, so some of the CMYK don't map uh, directly to the same uh, RGB values. But if you go from RGB to CMYK, in fact, then it's always uh, round trips. Uh, we can add, as I said, transparency to any of those. So if we wrap uh, with an alpha, any color model, and we give it a, uh, an extra value here, which is a, a transparency, we get uh, RGBA, HSI A, and YCBCR A, which is alpha. If you want to, uh, double wrap an alpha, you won't be able to do it. It'll give you a compile time error. Ah, oh, nested alpha channels are not allowed. Um, so this is color models, right? But we've started, we want to talk about color spaces. Okay, well, let's go to talk about color spaces. Let's bring in some imports. Similar stuff uh, that we import, uh, except we import color space instead of color model. And we also import the uh, image mo uh, module from a Haskell image processing library. This is this still using uh, um, the work I've been doing on uh, um, uh, during hack. It's still not pub uploaded on hack, it's not released yet, but hopefully it will be soon. Uh, the work I was doing at Zuri Hack was actually converting image processing library to use this color library and massive library. Um, not terribly important, we only, we only need this uh, for uh, showing some images and that's all. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what a color space uh, inside of the library is first. So there is a color space class and any color space is also a color model. So everything that I've mentioned so far is uh, uh, 
also uh, available for color spaces. And uh, there is a few helpers that allows us uh, to convert them back uh, uh, to between different color spaces. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, uh, but those mostly internal implementation details. But what I wanna stress uh, here about is this uh, crazy type. Um, if you're not familiar with functional dependency or data kinds, don't terribly need to understand them, but uh, it's definitely beneficial if you do. Um, but what, is, what it says essentially is for every color space, it's also a color model with the same precision, but this color space uh, also defines the illuminant. And this is the anything that is illuminant um, uh, is, is very, very important in a color space uh, uh, world and I will try to talk about that uh, in separately. Uh, this is our uh, color space class. A lot of those uh, definitions, you, uh, those functions you will never have to use except maybe this one, but uh, it's very important for the implementation. And there are color spaces, very, very strange looking ones and there is, it's just a very small fraction of what is available out there that I have implemented in this library. Um, there is a Python library called Color Color Science. Or color uh, it implements uh, quite a bit more, and I used some of the information from from there uh, as a as a source of truth. Um, okay, so let's go back here. Now let's talk about more theoretical stuff. Uh, not theoretical, more history, because uh, uh, I do owe you that. Um, so what is what does it mean to be a color? I want to. I don't know if Yuri is uh, on a call, but I want to thank him. He linked me to a very nice uh, blog post. Um, this one right here that uh, uh, does the introduction. I highly recommend uh, you reading it. It's. Uh, this address right here it should be visible on, on the recording so go ahead and read it it, uh, it will touch upon some of the things that uh, I'm talking about here um, so this is uh, I don't know if you know but in our eyes are structured in such a way that we have rods that are more that are sensitive uh, to light and mostly important in a very dim lit situations like at night and um, that's why we it's hard to distinguish color when there it's very, very dim, uh, when there's not enough light. Uh, but there is also cones that are responsible for, uh, for, for sensing color. And we have three types of cones, short, that are uh, sensitive to short uh, wavelengths, medium wavelengths, and long wave wavelengths. That's why it's called uh, LMS. It's actually a color space, but uh, that's not particularly important right now. What is important is when we talked about RGB when it's a color model, uh, it's not enough information for us to define a color universally. Um, and there is no really physical, uh, such phys physical thing as a color, right? We have wavelengths, uh, like electromagnetic wave, uh, so that, uh, that is a physical quantity. And it just so happens that our eyes are sensitive to these particular wavelengths. For example, um, uh, snakes, they can see in, in infrared. Uh, that's why they can see their prey at night. Uh, uh, bees can see, I believe, ultraviolet, so they can find nicer flowers. And we happen to be sensitive in, in, in this fashion, and that's why we see the colors that we see. Uh, but how do you define it universally in a digital world? In such a way that you know I can give you the RGB values, and you on the other side, uh, in, in Switzerland, for example, see exactly the same colors as you do right now. As back in the twenties, William David Wright and J. John Guild they set out to, to solve this problem, and what they did is uh, they took a few subjects, they gave each of them uh, three knobs because it was known that uh, people are sensitive to three different colors. I gave them three knobs and uh, uh, gave them a light. 
they looked at the light and uh, they um, tried to match that light by shifting the, the by switching those uh, three knobs and a bunch of uh, I believe there was like 17 uh, subjects altogether they took this data and they constructed the first uh, true color space which is called uh, uh, CIE 1931 RGB color space. The weird part about this graph is that it has negative red color, which doesn't make much sense uh, uh, because when you try to emit color, you, uh, well, you cannot take it away. And it's, uh, it, it turns out to be pretty important. Um, this, uh, talking in the three dimensions is a little bit harder uh, so what uh, we can do is uh, we can plot it on a on a 2D graph by restricting uh, uh, the value of blue, and uh, this is uh, the so-called spectral locus. And this is this part here is on a negative side, precisely because of this uh, negative uh, red dip. And this red dip here happens because these sensors in our eyes, they overlay and it cannot, it's not possible sometimes to construct a color without taking a color away. Okay, so what does that mean? This means that we can emit this little triangle, uh, essentially. Uh, but dealing with negative values is also very inconvenient so they took they did it even farther they shifted this uh, uh, with a little bit of linear algebra they shifted it to this looking horse horseshoe looking uh, uh, locus and this this as you will you can see find in any literature uh, is called uh, xyz color space and this is essentially all of the colors that the human can see and this triangle right here is essentially this triangle right here. So if you look at 546 uh, nanometers, it maps right directly to this, uh, to this dot right here. Okay, so what, that, what does that even mean for us, right? Well, this is a definition of uh, an RGB color space. The definition is, uh, one of the important part of the definition color space is a gamut, or gamut, however you pronounce it. Um, gamut is uh, is uh, three pairs of values. It's a uh, chromaticity of red, chromaticity of green, and chromaticity of blue. If you look at these values, they map directly to the these points right here. So this is red, which is right here, uh, then green, which is right here, and then there is a blue, which is right, right here. And the way we did it, we looked at the, we restricted gamma, which is a, a function with no arguments. We just give it a type uh, gamma, give us CIE RGB color space. Um, this, I'll tell you why this hole is, is there in a second. And well, double precision. And we get our gamma as a double precision uh, chromaticities. Now, um, this hole right here. This hole uh, is the illuminant. And if we look at uh, the type here of CIE gamma, uh, the, its illuminant is E, which is uh, equal uh, illuminant. And uh, it's right here. You can see it right here in the middle. It's a theoretical center of an uh, illuminant. Um, so if we look at the white point of the gamma, uh, we get it, at, this, is the, this is the value. And you can see here that this color space that we talk about, this, by the way, these values, they are in themselves uh, values in, in the color space. And the color space here is X, Y, little Y capital color space, which is uh, as amorphic to X, Y, Z color space. Uh, uh, the details not particularly important. Okay, uh, now, this is all the theoretical stuff that happened in 1931. Let's move a little forward in history and uh, talk about today and last few decades. I'm sure 
some of you, maybe even all of you have, have heard about these two color space, Adobe RGB and sRGB. sRGB is by far the most common color space. Your monitor is capable only displaying sRGB color space. Pictures, uh, photos that, that you take with your camera, uh, with your phone, they usually encoded with the sRGB color space. Uh, sometimes if you have um, you know, more expensive camera, you can set it to take a picture in Adobe RGB. And this is this uh, color space right here. What does this mean? Um, this means that these are the colors that we can see, and these are the colors that our monitors can reproduce, okay? So, and if you squint hard enough, if you look at this color right here, and this color right here, it's all the same. That's because our monitor cannot show it. Uh, well then, what the hell, why do we even bother with Adobe RGB if uh, our monitors can, cannot show sRGB, uh, anything outside the sRGB? Well, sometimes we need to print and manipulate the uh, uh, images, and Adobe RGB came into being with, uh, I believe, Adobe Photoshop 5.0 back in 98. Can, can I ask a question, Alexa? Absolutely, yes. So if I have a camera and film, how, how, do you know how much a film or a camera can do of that? So here's the deal with cameras. Cameras, they can absorb light, so they can absorb all of the colors that you see. As the human, I'm pretty sure, uh, I think. But definitely most of the colors that we can see, camera can absorb, right? And that's why you have a, a raw format. So if you take a raw format in, a cam, in a, um, professional cameras, it will contain all of the colors, right? right? But in order to emit light, like a monitor does, it cannot emit those, it cannot uh, show. Some of the more advanced monitors, they can go a little bit above, uh, outside sRGB, but not by much. So that it's the problem with emitting the light, not uh, the absorbing it, so. Okay, but if I printed it on photographic paper, I would see more colors, is that? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. that's why Adobe RGB is, uh, is useful, so you can yeah. print it, yes. It's still, you won't be able to print, of course, all the colors because there's some chemistry involved and yeah. they cannot show all of it. But yeah, that's really interesting, subject. yeah, okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, so yes, uh, both of these color spaces, they share the same illuminant, which is D65 illuminant. And in layman's terms, what's, what is an illuminant? Um, whenever you, uh, let's say in, in, in a room with con consistent lighting, uh, let's say fluorescent lighting, and you look at a, at a white piece of paper, it will look white to you. But let's say you switch the color to one of those Edison light bulbs, or uh, as they call it in Soviet Russia, Lenin light bulbs. Um, it will be a little bit more yellow. If you turn on red light, the white paper will look red to you. That's because the color of the physical object that reflects the, the color uh, depends on the, its illuminant. And that's what this illuminant is, is about. Uh, D65, it essentially means that this uh, uh, an object that, uh, is, uh, that has a temperature 65,000 Kelvin will have this, uh, this, this light. It will be shining with this, uh, with, uh, with this color, essentially. That's why colors can have, uh, described as temperatures sometimes. Uh, for example, you can buy a light bulb. Uh, I bought in my apartment uh, 4,000 Kelvin light bulbs uh, everywhere just so I have consistent light in all the rooms. Okay, that's a little bit uh, sidetracked, but it is sort of important. The important part is that they, they do share the same uh, uh, luminant, and why it's important, I will hopefully get to it uh, towards the end. Okay, so as I said, uh, uh, color uh, and luminant can have a uh, temperature. In this case, uh, it's about 65,000 Kelvin. Uh, why it's not exactly 65? It's because historically the Planck's con constant was different. That's not also terribly important. And the important part is the, that its coordinates on this uh, uh, on this locus is is this. 
right? And points directly where we can find it on a graph and we can plot it if we want to. Okay, let's take a look at the illuminant. And this is, uh, if it loads, there's quite a bit of doc documentation here. So quite a, quite, quite a few instances. And this, uh, these are available uh, uh, illuminants that are described in the different standards. This is the original standard from 1931. There was a follow-up uh, standard in uh, uh, 76, I believe. So there are other kinds of luminance. There, this is the 19, no, 1964. There was uh, the different standards defined slightly different, but those slight variations actually affect uh, uh, the values of the colors. So sRGB, and uh, Adobe RGB, they use this particular type. And they are different types, so if you try to mix them, the compiler will warn you, which is very important because they do represent different values. And you don't have this luxury whenever you look at, uh, let's say, Wikipedia pages. They will be talking about D65 Illumina, but depending on which standard they refer, they will have uh, slightly different values. Like, and usually it has to do with rounding or historical uh, error. Okay, so this is the illuminant that is being used by the sRGB color space. And each illuminant uh, is a, has a white point and the color temperature, and also color temperature at the type level, but that's just uh, uh, an extra part. Now, with all this, history behind us, let's actually do something with, uh, with the color space. Let's talk about sRGB color space, since it's the most common one. And this is just one random color that we could kind of construct. It has uh, values 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0.2, and that's happened to be green. Okay, there is uh, this little part here, nonlinear, and this is also very important. Uh, what does it mean? I'll talk about it in, in a second, but uh, since, uh, since it's already here, um, and uh, if you're not familiar with this tick, uh, this means it's a data kind. And data kind tells us that this L is of kind linearity, and it can only be two values, either linear or nonlinear. And uh, I didn't have it to do with, uh, with data kinds, but it does, uh, um, it does make everything much nicer when you actually try to, to work with it. Uh, it removes a lot of ambiguities. So let's go ahead and try to convert. This is the whole point of this talk is try to define a color in a particular color space and try to go to a different color space. So we have sRGB. This is what we can do, display in our monitors. This is what the, our images are. Great. Let's go ahead and convert this sRGB, this function convert color, to a color that is Adobe RGB, also nonlinear and with a float precision. Okay, great. We get Adobe RGB nonlinear color space. Awesome. Let's take a look at the values 0 0.28, 0 0.2, sort of close, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, sort of close. But look here 0 0.5 and 0 0.1, like worlds apart. It's so those completely different values but they both RGB so next time when somebody tells you here is the RGB values ask them what color space it is is this RGB is it Adobe RGB is it CIE RGB is it PT709 doesn't matter they without having this information you can't talk about the, uh, the actual color Whew. all right now uh, let's talk how this is done, how this conversion actually happens. This convert color function, what it does behind the scenes, and this is a, essentially its implementation uh, unwrapped. So it takes the sRGB color space, which is this type in, in a nonlinear form as a float precision. It calls decoding color component transfer function and takes it from nonlinear sRGB to linear sRGB. Okay, then it applies a normalized primary matrix from linear sRGB to XYZ color space with D65 illuminant. Okay, then it applies inverse normalized primary matrix 
and it takes from XYZ D65 Illuminum color space over to Adobe RGB linear. And then it applies encoding color component transfer function. This is ECCTF. And it takes you from Adobe RGB linear to Adobe RGB nonlinear. Whew. Let's run it. Sure enough, we can get the same values as here. That's encouraging. Do you need to know this when you work with the library? No, it's good to understand. And it's good uh, and it's very important to know that there are concepts such as linearity and uh, uh, the illuminant and that conversion happens through the XYZ color space. Just a little side note, thanks to some algebra, we can uh, combine these two steps into one. As an optimization, we can cook up a matrix that goes uh, directly from one linear RGB to another RGB, but that's not terribly important. This is uh, just an optimization. Uh, so let's go ahead and try to convert to uh, other color space, to XYZ color space and see how it looks. Uh, well, nothing particularly interesting. We don't know what it gives us, but this gives us the coordinates. So you, if you can convert this RGB to CA XYZ, it will give us a location on this gamut. And the, the reason why we have two values, uh, where was I? Where was I? And this Y is capital and not present here, it's just because the brightness is uh, set to always one. So what it, what, it, what it means is we see the most bright colors here and we don't, don't adjust that, but we see the colors. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about this linear, nonlinear stuff. What, what the hell is all this about? Here, I'll plot, plot a gradient of uh, a blue color, sRGB color, uh, that uh, red and green are set to zero, and we vary uh, um, uh, just the blue. And we, we have a very nice, uh, very nice gradient, as you can see, the uniformly goes from, uh, from black to red to red green. But if we try to do the same thing and we construct a linear sRGB color space, we get this. Get very black right here at the beginning and then this non-uniformity. And this has to do with the fact that our eyes are very sensitive to the changes right here with low energy, but uh, not so much here. And if you transfer in this data with the RGB pixels that are encoded with the 255 buckets, right, as in word eight, uh, you, you wanna con uh, keep that uniformity. You, you, uh, you don't wanna lose this information. And this is essentially an optimization when you transfer and display colors uh, for, uh, for the human beings, essentially. Um, so if you imagine this being not uh, 10 buckets as it is here, or 11 buckets. So, anyways, um, I've been to 55, then uh, you, you sort of get the idea why it's important for the for transferring the data. Okay, uh, what about those NPN and INPM? Uh, where do they, do, they, do they come from? So these uh, matrices, as you can see here, they are defined in the standard itself. So if you look at the sRGB standard, this, uh, this is the, the, these are the values that you will see. But you see they, they all end with zeros here. And that's because back in the day, we didn't care about too much about precision, but uh, uh, more about speed. And uh, there was quite a bit of rounding going on, but, and that's how they landed into the standard. But the standard is still there. Uh, so what, a lot of papers and uh, literature do, they talk about derived sRGB. These matrices, they can be derived from these, uh, um, from these three values, from the, uh, from the gamma. This is where these values were derived. And if we implement the derived values, which is imported from here, RGB, derived sRGB, we will get slightly more precise. Okay, and that's why if you look at 
the, let's say, Wikipedia. Okay. If you look at it in documentation for any color, you'll quite often see a matrix like that. So for example, this 3.24, this is right here, 3.24, and module of the rounding errors and, and discrepancies, uh, their values are very much the same. And as you can see, uh, this matrix takes you from XYZ color space in D with D65 aluminum over to RGB linear. And then we apply the gamma function. That's the function that takes you from uh, linear to nonlinear and the inverse uh, that goes from nonlinear to linear back. Whew. And this is how it looks, the, this, this gamma function, the transfer function, so-called. Uh, this is the original signal, and this is how it's uh, adjusted, so to say. And this is very, very important because uh, uh, in a lot of programs they, that do, don't have types, they don't uh, protect you from this mistake of uh, linear and nonlinear. Because when you look at just the values themselves, nothing tells you what, what are those. Are they in linear form or nonlinear form? And, uh, for example, if you read an uh, uh, a BMP image, for example, it doesn't have any color space information, it only has RGB values. Uh, then you can safe assume that it's sRGB color space, nonlinear, of course. Um, but it is important to note. And the reason why it's important is because uh, you cannot do any math on the nonlinear uh, images. So, for example, if you add two colors, you need to do this addition in uh, when they are in linear form. Uh, so that's one of the common mistakes, for example. Okay, so this is the values for the sRGB nonlinear, and this is sRGB nonlinear that is derived. And as you can see, they are slightly different because one is uh, one follows the standard, another one is derived, and you might notice that this derived sRGB has also a place for an illuminant. So we can actually change the illuminant where with a standard sRGB, we cannot do that because it's, it's, it's in a standard itself. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, I have some no. Let's go back and talk about this HSI, HSL, HSV. Those, despite what anybody will say to you. Huh? Sorry, I have a question. Uh, sorry sure. to do. just jump, jump in now. Oh, please, please do. The function that you showed for gamma, mm -hmm. that was very, very interesting. I, I never realized that it's not just a, like, a, I, I always assumed it's like power function. Mm -hmm. uh, one over two or one over 2.4 or something. Yeah, like right here, yeah. But it's like, it's like shifted then and there's like a part which is constant. Mm -hmm. what's, what's with that? Do you know what? What's yes. Happening? First of all, this is the gamma function just for sRGB. Adobe RGB has also a transfer function which is slightly different. Uh, and this little dip right here as you, uh, as you ask is is this thing right here. And this uh, is to prevent, uh, uh, I believe, an infinite value, because if, if it wasn't there, they, uh, it would give some sort of jump, and it would be visible. So they, they solve this problem with, a, with an extra uh, check, essentially. Um, uh, yeah, I see, it's like, it's a heuristically derived value, so it's it's nothing like backed by but hard yeah, math. So it's to prevent some kind of division by zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, and also it, it's structured in such a way that uh, there is no gap uh, in this in this point right here, right? So um, there is no no place where this function is undefined. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks. 
absolutely. Um, okay, that was a good question. Thank you. Um, now let's let's talk about these guys. So no matter what anybody tells you, none of this is a true color space. These all are just alternative forms of uh, another another color space. So whenever you look at the type con uh, at the, these uh, uh, con constructors, the uh, pattern synonyms in the library, and they all take three values uh, and four values for CMYK, okay, and they produce HSI that wraps some color space. Um, we're gonna miss you, Dominic. Don't leave. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. No, sorry. I have to. I've got some questions as well, but I can talk to you tomorrow. So uh, maybe some uh, uh, everybody can benefit from your questions. Maybe you can ask them right now. Uh, well, okay. Um, I was curious as to how it, <coughs> how why the schemes were developed in 1931. There weren't any computers in those days, so. But you need to define a color. Some the first actually uh, work on a color was done in agriculture because they wanted to specify numerically the color of the dirt in order to see how uh, uh, how good it is for agriculture. You know, and in order to be able to even put it on a paper, they needed to to write some numbers. Right? Oh, okay, yeah, that's. Uh, um, but there's there was other things. There was like you know, TVs for example, right? At some point they, they not 1931. I don't think color TVs. Well, they had color color movies came in the 30s, didn't they? So oh, do they? I, mean, well, I think so. Yeah. And my my other question was um, really about. I mean, the the only time I use colors because I don't do image stuff mm -hmm. is to draw charts. So I. I I maybe have a different color for a different mm -hmm. when I'm trying to show something different. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I mean, so I was curious as how, how do you is this mainly for image processing? This this if I was would I use it only for image processing or would I use uh, it to draw charts, for example? You could, for example, the color library with the British spelling. It's used uh, in. Uh, um, uh, in charts library, in Haskell charts library, right? To, for, yeah, yeah, you're to right. Yeah. colors, right? And yeah. you, you can go ahead and just, uh, let's look at this. When, when I was defining pixel sRGB, for example, right? You can go ahead and create colors with this and uh, uh, even uh, con construct a palette, for example, to pick colors and then use those colors for charts, right? And there is nothing preventing you from, from doing that. And uh, uh, so it doesn't necessarily need to be just for image processing. You can use just small sub portion of, of this library for this particular use case that you have. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I've done, sorry, just one, I, I really have to go in three minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be in trouble otherwise. Um, so I've tried to sometimes show things by changing the shading. Uh -huh. and it, from what I understand is if I do it in a linear way, uh -huh. then that won't really work. I need to use your non, I need to use the non-linear. Uh, that's more question, more involved question. I'll, is it? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would need to, to look at the details of what. Okay, forget that one then. Okay, yeah. okay well, we, thank we, you we very can much. talk about it offline, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, down. and uh, I'm sorry I'm missing the end of it, so. Um, uh, you missed you very the much. punchline, <laughs> but I'll share with you later. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Sorry. No Bye. Those were good questions, anyways. Uh, okay. So where was I? Oh yes, 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 yes. This uh, um, HSA, HSI, and HSL and HSV. Uh, they wrap around the the actual color space. So, for example, let's go ahead and construct um, uh, alternative versions of sRGB. Of the same color that we've constructed before. Let me give an apple. Um, and we get uh, different values. What this means is uh, not terribly interesting unless you're dealing with this particular uh, color space. Oh, and by the way, this now, 
as, as it is defined here, for example, this is a color space. So it, because it defines sRGB color space and you can go back to any other color space out there. Uh, but HSI by itself is not a color space. It's simply a color model. So we have HSI that is wrapping sRGB and these values are very similar. Those, those are hues. And uh, then saturation, uh, HSI defines saturation slightly differently, well, each one slightly differently. And uh, they have different historical reasons and uh, mostly used in, uh, uh, for, uh, in programs like Photoshop and, and such. For color picker is a, is a good example. And similar case, you know, the printing. Now, there is one thing that I haven't talked about is uh, how do you go from color to grayscale, right? We quite often need to do that. For example, if you look at Andrew's picture uh, in the meetup, uh, he, his picture is in, uh, in grayscale, right? So he, at some point, he had to go through, uh, from RGB picture to, uh, to grayscale. Uh, and in color, it's uh, uh, color terminology stands uh, for luminance. And this Y is the luminance. So this is the grayscale version of this color. And uh, the way we go from color to grayscale, we uh, either apply luminance or we convert to XYZ color space and we just extract this Y part. This is exactly the same. This is our luminance, this is our grayscale. Uh, which is very convenient, if you ask me. Okay, now, well, we also have the Y here, right, in our YCBCR, huh? and if we look at it, Y, well, this Y doesn't match this Y. How come? Well, this is because this Y is uh, nonlinear, and this Y is linear. <laughs> okay, and this, uh, made so many so much confusion uh, among developers and people who deal even even in literature, literature that talks about color they mistake those values so they even came up with a separate word for this called luma and luma is essentially a grayscale nonlinear that you went to the color Whew. okay uh, what about this ycbcr what, what's the deal with this this uh, is the color space that is still used uh, for encoding JPEGs and uh, let's say video co compression is, is still using it. For example, MP4 I believe uses it. And I really love the history why uh, how it came to being. Uh, back when they had uh, they were colored no black and white TVs. I guess it was before the thirties. There was only one single transfer to the radio waves that was uh, grayscale, right? And black and white TVs would capture the signal and display the, the, the video. Then they invented color TV, and what do we need to do? Now we need to transfer grayscale and three color, three color channels, RGB, in order to show the picture for the color TVs and grayscale for backwards compatibility for the black and white TVs. Well, that's very inconvenient. We need to transfer four channels. Uh, so some guy came up with an idea. Why don't we still continue sending the uh, grayscale information and a color difference, which is color in blue and color in red, and reconstruct it in a, inside of the color TV. So this allowed, uh, back in the day, the uh, black and white TVs uh, simply discard these two channels. They don't care about it, and they, they only cared about the grayscale. And the color TVs captured three channels, YCBCR, and reconstructed the color picture, which was a great move uh, for backwards compatibility. And it was invented so back, back when, and it's still being used. And the reason why it's being used, it's really good for compression. As you, as I've already probably mentioned, the, uh, our eyes are very sensitive to um, to lightness, but less so to color. So what they do in compression, for example, if we have uh, four frames in a row, uh, what we can do, we can 
have four frames of grayscale information and only one frame of color. Or uh, for every two frames uh, with, uh, uh, with grayscale, we have only one frame with color. And uh, this discarding of one frame it, it is very useful for the video compression because you can imagine that you know, discarding information and make, making us, our eyes not care about it uh, is quite useful. And uh, uh, also works out very well with uh, JPEG conversion, but for different reasons, I believe. No, but that's a similar reason. Doesn't matter. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, the, there is also this helper function RGB Luma, which comes uh, comes in handy. And this is uh, uh, the same Y. It's usually actually denoted with a tick. And I should have done the white with a tick here, but it's too late now. And th this is going to be. Uh, almost the same value as, uh, as here, just uh, modular errors. Let's look at an actual image. So we have this little nice froggy, and this this function uh, behind the scenes, it actually uh, give it a type of what the image is. And in this case, it's uh, YCBCR, you know, sRGB nonlinear, and it will be able to read it. If we give it something different, it will tell you, oh, I cannot, Decode this. Um, oops. So let's go ahead and bring it back. So this is our image. Um, okay, what can we do with it? Let's go ahead and read the same image and then convert this image into the uh, Adobe RGB color space. And then what are we going to do? We're going to cast an Adobe RGB image encoded into the sRGB image without any conversion. This, uh, this is essentially a, uh, uh, cast the color space without doing any conversion. Well, let's take a look at this, these two images. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the other side of uh, uh, the video. Uh, depending on the quality, but if you screen hard enough, this is sRGB. This is the, the way the picture was designed to look like. And this is the Adobe RGB that, that is displayed without a conversion. And if you look at the green colors, you know, this, uh, they're a little bit more dull. And that's all how it looks like if, when you mess something up with a conversion uh, in a regular software that doesn't have types. <laughs> um, so there is definitely a difference and we need to be aware of it whenever we deal with images, especially. And uh, not so much as Dominic said with plots. And, and, uh, and let's say if you're designing a web page uh, and deal with colors there, it's, everything is assumed to be sRGB most of the time. So there is uh, no importance there. Okay, now let's... Uh, Talk really quickly about this uh, uh, um, about the illuminant. So, back in uh, 1931, uh, they together with the uh, color space they defined the illuminants and. Uh, um, one of those luminances is D50. And in 1976, CIE also defined a color space called LAB. Uh, apparently it's uh, considered one of the best color spaces to work with, but I don't know too much about it. Um, let's go ahead and uh, try to do the same trick as we did before. Use convert color as RGB and we gave it, uh, this is the color space, the target color space that you want. Go ahead and try to convert it. Oh no, it tells us you can't do it. Before we could convert from sRGB to Adobe RGB because they had exactly the same illuminant. But uh, it's not as straightforward if you want to change the actual uh, uh, illuminant, for example, in this case, from D65 to D50. Which means essentially uh, white balance correction. If you've seen this in some uh, software options, this is what I'm talking about here. For example, you... Uh, took a picture in one lighting and you want to change it up a little bit, then uh, what you have to do is you need to do color adaptation. And there is no one way to do it. 
there is uh, uh, there is quite a few algorithms. So one of the most common ones is called Bradford adaptation with von Kreis uh, approach, color transformation. Don't need to worry about this uh, this particular detail. But what we need to know is uh, um, that in order to change the luminant, we need to apply something like that. And there is a function in library implemented called uh, adapt color, which uh, um, let's take a look at it. Uh, which accepts an adaptation algorithm. And what it does, it takes uh, a color in XYZ color space in, with one illuminant and gives you back XYZ color, color space with a different illuminant. And this approach right here allowed us to go from sRGB with D65 to uh, a lab D50. And this is the value that we're gonna get. Um, this is one of the very few color spaces where we, the, the values are from zero to 100 instead of from zero to one, but it's the peculiarity of this color space. Now, this is the punchline. There is one function inside of a library called convert. And what do you do? You give it a color space and then you tell it what color space you want in the end and it will figure out all of the math behind for you and will give you this value. Uh, and you don't need to know the linear algebra or uh, any of that stuff in order to, to, to use that. All you need to know is what's your source color space and what's your target color space. And that's usually somewhat documented. Okay, let's go ahead and recap what we've learned. Uh, we have color models. This is uh, the color models uh, that are implemented in the library. Uh, the, there is color spaces, uh, true color spaces uh, that uh, are available uh, by CIE RGB and CIE XYZ color space and LAB color space. It's usually denoted like that or in implementation with capital LABs. There are whole papers uh, on why that is the case. There is there are standardized uh, uh, RGB color spaces, and there is quite a few of them. If uh, if we look at this, uh, even in the library here, we have two color spaces here, RGB color space, two color spaces here, and uh, that go back to the to the TV times. And uh, in fact, sRGB is based, uh, and Adobe RGB is based on some of the values from these color spaces as well. Uh, do you really need to know about them? Not really, but they are there. <laughs> For, uh, there might be somebody who actually needs them, so let's put it this way. Uh, so there, there are these uh, red, green, and blue color spaces, and red, green, and blue color space is always defined with a gamma, white point, and a transfer function. The only, there's very few that don't define a transfer colors, transfer function, and one of them is this RGB color space. And alternative uh, uh, color models that uh, you can use uh, in order to work with a uh, particular color space. Uh, just more convenient to do some, some stuff more than the other. There are grayscale uh, values, which is linear and nonlinear, and they call luminance and luma. And we have uh, a concept of color adaptation, which changes the luminance from D something to D50 to D65 and so on. Okay, uh, this is the stuff that really I wanted to cover. We have uh, a little bit more time. Uh, I want to talk just slightly about this uh, HSV and, uh, and an example of why it's uh, useful. Um, so let's go ahead and bring some imports. And uh, this, uh, this function creates gradient. What this does here, it's not uh, terribly important. It's just a bit of trigonometry on uh, uh, move stuff around. What is important is it creates a, a, a pixel with a, a hue being varied and saturation and value always set to one. Okay. And we create two images. One is uh, HSV nonlinear and HSV linear. And we simply put them together right next to each other. We need to do a bit of conversion in order to concat them together. So let's go ahead and take a look at how it looks. You might have seen it in some color pickers because that's uh, essentially the hue. 
And if you look, this is the nonlinear and this is linear. And that's why a uh, nonlinear version is a little bit more user friendly whenever you pick colors. As I said, our eyes just happen to work that way. Um, and uh, I wanted to, when I was Googling uh, uh, for, for, for this stuff in order to get some information, I found this real life example. And there is thousands of examples like that online. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Um, we all programmers, so I think it, it, it will be useful. Um, okay. Uh, let's bring it here. So this is the, uh, essentially a stack exchange question. And it talks about some software, some software that uh, I don't even know about. It's called Blender and it has a color picker. Look at this. It looks very similar as to this, this thing right here, except rotated a little bit. And it shows HSV color space. Well, HSV, nonlinear sRGB, obviously. And uh, it converts to RGB. And what he says is that every software he finds for these values of HSV gives him this hex. Uh, and when he converts in with, uh, with other languages, this is the value that he gets for, as a floating point. But these are the values that uh, this Blender software gives him. So what's, what's the deal with this? Let's go ahead and I, I code it up real quick here. So this is the hex value that he gets. This is the, the operation that he does in, in order to get these values. He uh, constructs an HSV color model, 0.4.81. And he does the conversion from HSV to RGB. And this is what he gets. So this is the hex value that he gets. This is the, um, the floating point value that he gets, 0 0.2, 1, 0 0.52, okay? So everything is right. But it, this Blender software gives him these values, 0 0.33, 1, and 0 0.23, 0 0.235. Okay, this is the value. And what happens behind the scenes is uh, <laughs> this Blender software shows HSV is uh, nonlinear. Here is also nonlinear, but RGB shows as linear. And it doesn't show anywhere in, uh, in the UI why this is the case. And uh, I think it was a bug in the, in the software that I fixed it. So this is not, not uncommon when you deal with colors. Uh, I think that's, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so any more questions? At any rate already, uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. And yeah, we have, we have time for questions. So if anyone has mm -hmm. any questions, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, amazing talk and uh, I don't, I have a bunch of questions, but I, I don't want to be the only one who is asking. So if someone else wants to ask, I feel well, you are the least shy one, so should we have some time? <laughs> yeah. So I have uh, two two theoretical question and one practical question. Which one do you want first? Let's do the practical one. I'm not very the big practical on theory. one is uh, so. Um, I sometimes in my spare time, like code uh, very simple games. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that like uh, the, the big AAA games, uh, usually when they, when they are like moody and dark, they uh, have a thing in the beginning when you choose the gamma, mm -hmm. how uh, this kind of, how dark should the dark be? So, so how, how can I use your library to do like different non-linearity? So great question. What you need to do is you would have to define your, uh, your own color space. And this is uh, not that hard to do. Uh, you can follow uh, any of the definitions uh, that are already available as an example. And uh, uh, when, you, when you do that, um, you need to look for a red, green, blue. This is the uh, RGB color spaces. And when you define this color space, you define the gamma. So you can just go ahead and reuse, for example, sRGB. That would be the, the right choice. 
uh, the NPM and NPM, you can uh, also reuse the defined values that are already available in the, in the library. Or you can leave them derived, that's fine too. And then what you need to do is you need to define this, uh, these two functions. This uh, essentially the gamma function. And you can define them to be whatever you, you, know, you feel like it. Uh, and uh, that color space that you will define will be some sort of RGB color space that is uh, not standard one. Um, and it will work with uh, all other libraries. And for example, if you decide to convert it from to a screenshot of uh, uh, from your color space into the, an actual file, an a JPEG, it, this library can help you with that. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It might be useful to I don't know to have it as an example, something like that. <laughs> uh, Ooh, uh, could be. I mean, uh, I'll. I'll accept the PR. <laughs> oh. right. the, the, the examples are already there. I mean, if you look at the code, this is this would be essentially you know copy and pasting an existing uh, existing thing from the library, uh, and it's I don't know if, how how common of a use case that you're talking about. Maybe it is. I just uh, I don't. It might sound surprising, but I don't deal with any of this stuff at work or in my professional life. Uh, this is simply a hobby. I looked at, I started at a bunch of standards, compared a bunch of values, uh, decided which one is the correct ones, uh, fixed a few mistakes uh, in different blog posts. Um, uh, yeah, that's my extent of the, of the knowledge of the, of the color. But how it's used, the only use cases I know is in image processing, and that's pretty straightforward. Uh, all right. I, I, I'll turn my, my camera so we can okay. talk to each other. Uh, so a theoretical question. One is, and I'm really afraid of opening the, the can of worms, is you, you, you were talking about this uh, luminance and it's a nonlinear version luma like how mm -hmm. to how to uh, take a, a like a color and and translate it into grayscale but what mm -hmm. does it what does it mean like what does it mean that like a green color is uh, is and the blue color corresponds to same gray grayscale is it is it something related to like the human eye Mm -hmm. Or is it just what is the power of the of the electromagnetic thing in that? Uh, uh, well, that? It, it's it basically the mapping of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of the electromagnetic waves to our eyes, right? Uh, for example, let's say you're completely a colorblind person. What are you mm -hmm. going to see? You're not going to see colors. You're going to see everything in grayscale because that's still available to you. And what you're going to see is, well, uh, converting those uh, those wavelengths into a single channel, which is a grayscale, and you will see only brightness. Uh, a good example in real life that I actually thought about it to my, myself. It's not also theoretical answer; it's a more practical answer. Go ahead and turn on your uh, turn off the light in your room completely, right? And just just enough uh, light, right? Not right now, but uh, at some point. Wait for about a half an hour when you so for your eyes to uh, adjust. Very sensitive. Our these devices they're very sensitive. Even almost in complete darkness, you will still be able to see stuff. But if you look at something that is very colorful normally, it will look grayscale to you, right? Uh, or maybe a little bit of color you will see, but very very little. But you will see the object. So that's that's what converting from color. To, to, to the grayscale is in the uh, real world. And uh, what, what I was showing you was more practical of how to convert a color picture into a black and white TV. This is a practical part, right? <laughs> so uh, just, just to summarize that in this XYZ, uh, like this theoretic color space, the Y corresponds not to something uh, a uh, simple physical thing about the the uh, like combination of wavelengths, but to some to to the thing that how humans perceive it, right? Yes. Cool. Well, 
Uh-huh. Even if you think about colors, right, in, in, in general, as I was saying before, for example, mantis shrimp has 16 color receptors, 16 cones, 16 different types of cones, right? So how many colors it sees, uh, we can't even imagine possibly, right? Uh, dogs have only two, two cones and they will see less colors than we do. Yeah, so um, I don't know. It's 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 a little bit of a practical uh, uh, thing, uh, not just theoretical. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like one thing that I, I I always struggle with when I want to choose when I want to choose colors, mm-hmm. and uh, like I want to choose a bunch of colors. Um, I don't know. The latest example was, uh, for example. There is this Emacs mode where you can you can colorize parentheses, mm-hmm. uh, uh, re- rainbow delimiters. Uh, it's the name, and I want to have different colors, but all of them to be uh, more or less the same uh, brightness and mm-hmm. and like the same um, color intensity. So mm-hmm. like HSL or HSV or that kind of uh, color space, color model, I don't know, sorry, uh, is, seems to be good, good for that. Mm-hmm. But whenever I try, the colors are not actually the same br- brightness. It's mm-hmm. like I choose the same value and, uh, and lightness, intensity, and yeah, I get like the, the whole rainbow. But no matter how I look at them, they are not the same brightness. I think it, yeah, I don't know the concrete answer to this, but I think it goes to the to the fact that our eyes are sensitive to different colors differently, and that it will adjust the brightness of it. But what I would suggest, I think, is not to try to do it manually, but look at the, not from the HSV, for example, palette, but look at at the existing palettes out there. Mm-hmm. Right. For example, just for the proof of concept, I implemented the RAL uh, uh, standard, which is physical colors. Like, for example, this uh, wall is painted with the uh, RAL 9003. Right. It's a white signal white color. They all have names. They all have numbers, and uh, encoded at a type level. And uh, if you go to any store and you ask them for paint. You tell them there's the number and they will construct your paint, you know, mix it up and it will look exactly the same as, right? So the same thing goes for, uh, for example, there are web colors. There is web palettes. They're predefined colors with names and you can choose from there. And they, some people already thought about it. They picked the best colors. They thought they were good usable colors. And uh, that's what I would suggest. But uh, I, yeah, it's 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 a good suggestion, and that's what I wanted to do. I'm just lazy and like copy pasting a bunch of numbers in, into my Emacs config seemed li- a little bit silly. And uh, like with HSL, I c- I could just do it programmatically. Mm-hmm. Okay, I need eight different colors mm-hmm. all around the the rainbow and. Um, well, you can do, works. yeah, and you can use this library for doing this stuff precisely, right? Yeah, because it, you, what you need to do, you need to pick a color, and then you can need to convert to a hex value, which is a sRGB, right? And yeah. uh, so this, uh, you can do this programmatically with the color library. Yeah. So, all right. Last, last question. This, okay. uh, this Bradford adaptation, and and again, I, I'm afraid that I'm opening a can of worm. What does it mean? Like, what, 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 what the hell is that illuminant? And uh, like, I'm, yeah, I understand that, that, so, so why there, why is there no uh, one, uh, not because like one way to, to, to convert color? With, there, there is no uh, mathematical, definition of the one right way of how it works like for example they figured out how to display a color right but how to change the illumination uh, uh, there are a few different different uh, um, different adaptations algorithms and different uh, matrices uh, that were cooked up by some people that they're more heuristical 
right? So one, if you look, uh, if you ask one person and you give them, okay, this was adapted to this, uh, this Illumina, does it look right to you, right? So something along those lines. I'm, I'm not quite sure the, uh, why one is better, like who decides that, but in the community, it seems like the Bradford adaptation seems to be mostly used. Uh, some of them, like Von Kreese, uh, I think it was the guy, the guy's name, who came up with a method, and this was the, his original matrix, but then they found out that matrix is not that good, but the actual method is good, so they cooked up uh, new matrices, and when you apply them to the, uh, while doing adaptation, this gives you a good change of illuminant. Because, yeah, so I, 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 I understand like what's the, what's the um, theoretical issue uh, uh, behind it, like the actual, the actual uh, um, electromagnetic radiation, it's like an infinite dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. And we, we just project it into three dimensions. And that's what our it. eyes do, by the way. Yes, that's, this yeah. is incredible, isn't it? <laughs> we can project it in three dimensions this way and that way. And, and once you are in three dimensions, you cannot go back to the infinite dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. and like these two, two projections can, can be like very different. Uh, so there is no one-to-one -one correspondence. But I was just thinking that, that yeah, but we can just we could actually figure out how humans see and like if you turn the light uh, a little a little bit. Uh, well, yeah. I think so that's I, I, how they did it. I think that's that's probably the, you know they also put a bunch of subjects and figured out what's the best way to do it. I, I, yeah, I'm just a little bit surprised that there is. Uh, uh, there might be an answer, you know, if you find a, a good answer for this question, you know, send it on on Slack. I'll be. Curious to read about it as well. There's, it's incredible how much uh, stuff I had to dig up in order to be able to even understand. There is, uh, there is books on this on this topic, and uh, no one uh, good explanation, I would say. Uh, like yeah. there is a, one big. Uh, post about a red uh, sRGB color space that is referenced everywhere, right? In, uh, Wikipedia pages, uh, everywhere. And uh, it has so many mistakes. It's, it's unbelievable. Like if you compare it to the actual standard to, that you look at that was defined in, you know, 1931, this is the standard, it's, there is mismatch. For example, um, there is Illuminant, right? CIA in 1931. CA in 1964, and there is also a separate module here, Illuminant Wikipedia, because on Wikipedia, that is being a very common source of values, they have different values than the standard actually defines. And how they cook them up, there is math behind it, who did it? I don't know, I wasn't able to find it anywhere else but on Wikipedia, so, but, but because, Many people use it. I did go ahead and edit the library. Uh, cool. I mean, all of those errors are very little, right? But those errors do accumulate whenever you do a bunch of transformations on a, on a, on a color. Yeah, all right. Thanks again. Uh, uh, Thank uh, you for the questions. Talk. I, I give space to other people. While there is silence, I'll let you know that um, the, if you ever need to do some sort of image processing, very soon there is going to be a library, there is already a library, uh, HIP, that uses REPA and Vector uh, to modify images, but I'm translating it to use Massive and uh, uh, Color library. Uh, and for example, I don't know if you got a chance to notice here uh, we I read an image just very easily from from this folder right here uh, and do bilinear scaling now scaling with bilinear uh, um, interpolation on it just because the original image is too big and and it does it's so much so so easy as I would say <laughs> 
So, any any questions? No, I think. Yeah, that was going to be my question. What's your what's your motivation? What's your use case for this library? This is, you know, one of the common questions I've been I'm being asked, and uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing now. Um, back when I was in college, I wrote this image processing library. I was learning image processing, and uh, I took it as a grad course, and uh, it, this was a fascinating topic for me. And I found this repo library, which was doing image, uh, you know, parallel processing of arrays and stuff. And then I started learning more, more and more, and I learned that I can do much better than what is what it is out there. So it started with image processing, then it went back to de defining my own image pro uh, array processing library, now my own color library, because there is no real good solution. Uh, and I use Juicy Pixels for actually decoding, uh, you know, for the, uh, the images, you know, PNG and JPEG images, what have you. And you can, Unlike Juicy Pixel, you can actually use one single function to do that. And uh, now my final goal is to adjust this image processing library. And I don't really have a use case for image processing library. I just <laughs> enjoy the topic. <laughs> well, I, I'm yet to use any of this work that I've done at work. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So yeah. Um, right, if there are no more questions, uh, again, thanks a lot for the great talk. Thank you for inviting um, me. I think, yeah, pleasure to have you. And uh, yeah, I think I'll stop the recording at this point. But if you want, we can still hang out a bit. Sounds good, yeah. Here.